Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our show, It's All in Your Head. I am Angie, and I'm here with Dr. Paul Swingle today to talk about the neurotherapeutic treatment of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and pain. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Swingle. Prior to moving to Vancouver, Dr. Paul Swingle was full professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa. A fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Dr. Swingle was a lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, an attending psychologist at McLean's Hospital in Boston, where he was also coordinator of the Clinical Psychophysiology Service. Dr. Swingle is a registered psychologist in British Columbia, certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. His newest book, Biofeedback for the Brain, was published by Rutgers University Press, and it is available on our website at soundhealthproducts.com. During this webcast, you're welcome to send us questions. We will have two Q&A breaks to go over these questions, so please do not hesitate to send them to me. You can do so by using the chat box that is located on the control panel. Okay, so let's get started. Let me welcome Dr. Paul Swingle. Good morning. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and it is one of those conditions that can be extremely troubling and very troubling to healthcare providers. It wasn't very long ago that uh, we thought that this was uh, just a condition of uh, severe emotionality and uh, had nothing at all to do really with uh, any physical condition. It was kind of a hysterical reaction. Uh, and the ratio of male to female is almost 11 to 1, females to males. So uh, you can see that uh, in our not too distant uh, past, uh, we could very well misconceive uh, what's going on here. Now, there are a lot of issues associated with trying to consider what's going on with fibromyalgia. And we're going to be going over some of these areas in pretty uh, substantial detail. Uh, <clears throat> we've made huge, huge progress in the treatment of this, even though, as you'll see later on, uh, in many of the uh, healthcare communities, it's considered a non-treatable non uh, condition. That is, it's, there's nothing that you can do other than try to maintain and uh, deal with the pain associated with it. Uh, there are a couple of giants in the field in terms of uh, work that's been done. Dr. Donaldson in uh, Calgary made some uh, very significant breakthroughs in terms of uh, how we define this and how we treat it. Symptoms and characteristics. A couple of things I want to point out because we're going to see this repeated over and over and over again. Uh, the first, uh, of course, is uh, just a general idea of what's going on, and that's widespread myofascial pain, that is pain in the soft tissues. Uh, it's all over the body. There are multiple <coughs> painful points. Uh, the other characteristic of fibromyalgia is that the pain tends to uh, shift around a bit. <coughs> the uh, focal points uh, or the more intensely uh, painful points tend to shift around the body. And it's the entire body usually that's uh, implicated. Sleep disturbance is a number one issue here. And you can see that 85% of the individuals will indicate they have serious sleep disturbances, frequent wakening, non-restorative sleep. And one of the things that you'll see as we proceed, if we can get the person uh, into a situation of somewhat better sleep is a game changer. We get a lot of comorbid conditions associated with anxiety, uh, headaches, temporal uh, mandible joint disorders, uh, irritable bowel, and uh, muscle, perceived muscle uh, swelling. A lot of people come in not for the fibromyalgia per se because they've been led to believe there's nothing much they can do about it other than uh, uh, various uh, pain medications. They come in for the, what's called fibrofog. 
and in fiber fog, individuals just feel <laughs> that they're not as sharp as they feel they should be. Their short-term memory is bad, multitasking uh, is problematic, and concentration and focus. It's kind of like the feeling you have if you have a viral infection, you know, you have that foggy uh, cotton in your head feeling. That's what uh, these folks complain about. Like everything else, it's exacerbated by stress. Now, <clears throat> it's not an uncommon condition. You can see we're dealing with anywhere from 2 to 8 percent of the population. So this is not a rare or trivial kind of uh, condition. It's pretty widespread. Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of causes. And what we mean by causes, uh, people can identify when it appeared as though the fibromyalgia started to manifest. The big one is trauma, and I'm talking about the emotional trauma now. Uh, individuals who have experienced severe, severe emotional stress. Now, head injury is highly correlated with fibromyalgia. Uh, so, in addition to head injury, uh, you also have the emotional uh, component of that. If you're in an automobile accident, for example, above and beyond banging your head, You've had an emotional trauma. The second is viral infection. Uh, the third is stress. And typically, we have a combo of all of those things. And what we're going to see in the EEG patterns as we go on is uh, that we have a lot of uh, areas in the brain that are implicated. And <clears throat> these are the ones that we're going to be looking at. And uh, I'll go over all of this in the uh, very great detail as we're proceeding. We're going to find that there's a deficiency in the back of the brain in terms of stress, uh, tolerance, and sleep. Uh, we're going to find that there's a lot of slow frequency activity in the front part of the brain. That's that fiber fog stuff. And we're going to see some other uh, situations associated with uh, uh, emotional volatility, for example. Now, I may be preaching to the choir here. A lot of folks are really familiar with a lot of this EEG business, but let me just briefly review this. <clears throat> what we're looking at is the electrical activity coming from the brain, and <clears throat> we put an electrode, a series of electrodes on the head, and we're able to measure the electrical activity of the brain, and we can break that signal down into its components. So the white line on top is the raw signal as it comes out of the head. And then we can break that down into its components. So you'll see up here we have very slow wave activity. And then every once in a while you'll see there's a burst like in there. That's fast frequency activity, <laughs> beta activity. And we can break that down in a procedure, fast Fourier analysis as it's called, or with filters. And we can take the slow activity out. This is theta. And then we can take the alpha activity out. That's here, about 8 to 12 cycles a second. And then the very fast, that was fast activity, the beta, we can pull that out. See this beta up there? We're pulling that out. <clears throat> and that's uh, 16 to 25 cycles a second. And we can present that in what's called a spectral ar array. Now, this is a nice, healthy. Uh, uh, measurement of a brain, uh, measurement of a healthy brain activity. And we have an algorithm here, as you can see. This is the low frequency down here, about a half a cycle a second, up to 40 cycles a second. You can see that there's a nice distribution. The faster frag activities have lower amplitude. So the algorithm is, frequency is inversely related to amplitude. So this is what we're working with. We're working with the various waveforms, alpha, theta, beta, and we're working on how they're, they're related to one another and what that implies in terms of activity in specific areas of the brain. And we're going to focus on the hot spots. These are the hot spots that I've identified over the last 30 years or so so that we can do very rapid assessments of brain activity and have a very, very good idea of what's uh, going on in a person's uh, uh, 
uh, life and condition just from measuring those five spots. Now, the diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia, and I'm not big on labels, as many of you folks know, uh, but <clears throat> uh, for insurance purposes, <laughs> the diagnostic uh, criteria, history of widespread pain, well, what they mean by widespread is it's all over the body for at least three months, both sides of the body, top and bottom of the body, and pain is present in the axial skeleton, that is the neck, mid-back, low-back. There are 18 tender points that they test for a determination of fibromyalgia. And again, the silliness of uh, you have pain in at least 11 of 18, what if you have 10? But in any event, that's beside the point. In terms of uh, the uh, accepted uh, diagnosis, you must have uh, pain in 11 of those 18 points at, on, uh, when palpitated, and about 4 kilos of pressure when they're palpitated. It's not just tender, it's pain. And these are the 18 sites. So you can see uh, up on the neck, up on the, just under the shoulder blade, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, clavicle, uh, and out on the uh, exterior and interior here just above the knee and then uh, across the back, okay? Now, there's predisposition to fibromyalgia. So you can see children of a fibromyalgia parent and 28% uh, in fibromyalgia. Blood relative, 26%. Males, you can see that there's a big difference in terms of the transfer or heritability, as we say, associated with these conditions. <clears throat> Female with blood relative, you can see there's a huge difference between the heritability of this uh, regarding males versus females. Now, patients with fibromyalgia are 11 times more likely to have restless leg syndrome. And restless leg, of course, is you, you're, uh, you just have that antsy feeling in your legs and the legs moving around and uh, you just can't get them quiet. Now, the reason this is so important is that restless leg is one of the number one interrupters of sleep. So here we have a situation in which the fibromyalgia is associated with restless leg. Restless leg gives rise to poor sleep. Poor sleep is directly related to exacerbation of fibromyalgia. So there we have our loop. Now, suicide risk with fibromyalgia patients. Any condition that people are defining as non-curable uh, or non-treatable, I don't like the word cure, treatable, uh, always gives rise to feelings of hopelessness and so forth, why me, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the suicide risk associated with uh, fibromyalgia is not apparent in males. Now, the end, that is the size of the population, isn't very large, but nonetheless, they don't find any relationship between fibromyalgia and increased suicide risk, but it is quite prominent in the female population. So if you look at the standard mortality ratios, death from suicide is really up there, and death from other conditions also is uh, elevated, associated with fibromyalgia, not so with males. Now, pediatric fibromyalgia is really a problematic condition, and it's sad to see this because if you don't deal with it very, very uh, rapidly, then it has a major impact on the child and the child's development and feeling of self-worth and all the rest of it. Uh, fatigue factors, uh, pain factors, of course, but again, Look at this, sleep disturbance, 96%. So and this is why we focus a lot on sleep. If we can get the sleep quality under control, it's a game changer. And this is the 
and the uh, news associated with the treatments, fibromyalgia therapies, uh, pharmacological uh, therapies, what they use are, they use uh, GABA analogs, they use SSRIs, uh, antidepressants, uh, and excuse me, the non pharmacologic therapies that they tested were uh, exercise, acupuncture, and psychotherapy. There's no comparison here with neurotherapy, you'll notice. But this is the interesting thing. There's no significant difference in the effectiveness between drug and non-drug therapies. They're both not very good. And the study may show a drug effect, but the, the effect of the drugs are lost once the patient is not taking them. But have a look at this. And this is, again, 3,000, uh, population of 3,000 uh, patients with uh, fibromyalgia. Overall, no improvement was seen in fatigue or functional status in improvement in pain. Okay, no improvement. <clears throat> the top 10 most beneficial fi therapies for fibromyalgia, not a single drug was mentioned. What were the considered the 10 most harmful therapies? They named only approved drugs. Exercise, in the uh, conclusion of this uh, uh, researcher, aerobic exercise appeared to be most helpful. So that's not very hopeful uh, view for a patient to have. So here's where neurotherapy is a game changer. First thing we do, we want to give a biofeedback device to the patient to take home. We want the individual to get moving. This is grandma's advice. Uh, grandma always told me, get your duff off the sofa and get moving. Okay, Very, very good advice at any age. So this will give you a, a uh, recording of how many steps you've taken during the day, how long, how far you've gone, and so forth and so on. And it's a direct feedback device. You put it on in the morning and uh, take the recording at night before you go to bed. 10,000 steps is an active person, F less than 5,000 is an inactive person. And, and the pedometers are readily available all over the place. Just go to your local pharmacy and they're very inexpensive and of course we have them as well. Now, what does fibromyalgia look like? What's the brain look like? We have a variety of different profiles that we find routinely with fibromyalgia. Now there are variations and I'm going to go through some of the variations so that you get an idea of just how we approach this. And now the first thing is that we're measuring right on top of the head and what I'm finding here is in the back of the brain, O1 is the back of the brain, and this is the ratio of slow, remember theta, 8 to 12 cycles a second, to fast, that's the ratio of the amplitude, beta is 16 to 25 cycles a second, and we're looking at how strong those are, so it's the ratio of the amplitudes. Eyes open is 0.61, eyes closed is 0.65. We want that between 1.8 and 2.2. This person is one-third of the value of what we want to see. And there is the fundamental thing that we see routinely in fibromyalgia. And what that, the consequences of that, poor stress tolerance, anxiety, and the biggie is poor sleep. This is a direct indicator of sleep quality. So I know this person has a horrible sleep problem. Now we're looking at the front part of the brain and the major factors that we're looking at here. The first is depression. And what we're seeing here is that this individual has a huge market for depression and the marker for depression is when the right side of the front part of the brain is much more active than the left side. And this person has a huge marker for depression. 
The other thing we look for is, uh, is there an excess of slow frequency on the right side of the brain? And we can see that there is. In both cases, both alpha, which is a slow frequency, and theta, there's much more on the right relative to the left. And that's the marker that Dr. Donaldson, Stu Donaldson, uh, and discovered oh, 10, 12 years ago or so and that it's one of the markers that you find with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. Now, FZ sits right in the front of the brain, right in the center. So it's the center frontal midline. And what we're looking at there is we're looking at data, numbers that come from a subcortical structure referred to as the anterior cingulate gyrus. That's the area of the brain associated with obsessive compulsive behavior. Now what we're finding here is this individual has huge activity in that region of the brain, meaning get something on your mind, you can't get it out. And there's a lot of fretting and worrying. And then finally, we find that the brain efficiency measures, that's the low to high alpha, is very, very slow. This is extremely important because what we found recently is that if the brain alpha is not efficient, not fast, the entire brain is not efficient and people respond less favorably to all medications. They even respond less favorably to transcranial stimulation, the kind of stimulation that's used uh, for the treatment of depression. Individuals that have poor brain efficiency, as, it, as measured by this particular measure, do less well no matter what the therapy is. Now this person has a 30 year history of fibromyalgia, a very long history of depression, and is medicated <coughs> with uh, antidepressants. So this is the ki typical kind of client that walks in the door, 50 year old female, long history of fibromyalgia, long history of inadequate treatment. I don't mean inadequate in an incompetent manner, I mean that just nothing works and long histories of various medications. So what we were finding there is we were finding in the back of the brain we weren't getting enough activity associated with the ability to quiet and for good quality sleep. And in the front part of the brain we were finding that we had the marker for depression and we had the marker for <coughs> the cognitive fog that people talk about, uh, which is one of the markers for uh, fibromyalgia. And there was elevated activity in this area of the brain associated with perseveration. The person just can't get the stuff out of her mind. And of course, that also markedly interferes with sleep. Okay, thank you, Dr. Swingle. We have um, a first question here. Uh, it's from a professional in the field. He's asking, on the O1, is beta too high or theta too slow? Perfect question. Uh, whenever we're doing these assessments, <clears throat> there are qualitative differences in the, uh, the way that the patient presents. If you have a, a deficient theta-beta ratio because theta is inadequate, that tends to be a bit different than if beta is in excess. And of course, you get both. Now, it's interesting in terms of how you talk to the client and what you see in the way the client presents to you. But in terms of treatment, what it means is you go after what looks like the, the uh, most problematic area. Now, if it's beta, what you want to do is drive down beta. If it's deficient theta, you want to drive up the theta. And often you do both. You set up your parameters so that when the brain's doing what we want it to do, which means the strength of beta is going down and the strength of alpha uh, theta is coming up, that's when the client hears the tone. Uh, in terms of being able to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 
uh, self-modulate and self-regulate their brain activity. There are, uh, if the situation is deficient theta, they tend to respond more rapidly than if it's def uh, uh, elevated beta. But uh, when we do the clinical assessments, that is the EEG assessments, those are exactly the issues that the professional has to look at in terms of how do you most efficiently treat this client. Thank you. And the next question is, my doctor wants to give me antidepressant medications for my fatigue. I don't think I'm depressed, I'm just always tired. Do you think antidepressants would help? Uh, well, it's interesting. That's very similar to the case we just had. Uh, one of the side of, oh, I'm sorry, one of the uh, prominent uh, symptoms associated with depression is fatigue, which is why your physician is considering <clears throat> uh, giving you uh, antidepressants, hopefully that uh, uh, you will sleep a bit better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and you will have a uh, recovery of uh, more vitalization so that you will become more active. I mean, that, that's the, the rationale behind that. Uh, personally, I think there are much more efficient ways of going at, uh, after it. I would want to know what your brain is telling me. Then, based on that, I might, uh, you know, there might be a different medication because we use the brain assessments to uh, assess the potential efficacy of medications. Uh, neurotherapy and medical practice blend perfectly with one another. Okay, well thank you. We can continue and we can, uh, there's going to be another um, break uh, before the end of the show. Thanks. Okay, so this is a 49 year old female <coughs> uh, with a history of traumatic brain injury. Now, when we're looking up at the locations right on top of the head, you see that red uh, uh, highlighted uh, number there. This is telling me that the brain is recording uh, exposure to severe emotional stress. This is what we call the trauma marker. Now the trauma marker is uh, based on the alpha response. Alpha again is a, a brain wave between 8 and 12 cycles a second. And we measure the alpha when your eyes are open and then we ask you to close your eyes and see how much the alpha increases in amplitude. Now the reason it goes up is because when you close your eyes you are cutting off the visual field. So the visual cortex becomes less stimulated and you're getting an increase in uh, alpha associated with that. Now there are a lot of things we know about that. One is artists tend to have very strong alpha responses. But the other thing that we found, and I just published a, a paper on this, and that's alpha blunting associated with, with uh, uh, negative emotions. And one of the things that we found here, and I discovered this initially at McLean Hospital, at Harvard Medical School when I was working with combat vets who were hospitalized for post-traumatic stress disorder. They don't have an alpha response. It goes negative. And that makes infinitely good sense if you think about it because it's the brain trying to protect itself against flashbacks if I can anthropomorphize the brain in that sense. So when we see this blunting, the first thing that we want to know about is trauma. So when we do these uh, intake brain assessments, we're forming hypotheses about why is this client sitting in front of us. So I know there's a trauma marker here. This person's been exposed to severe emotional stress. Second is, here's our guy in the back of the brain. So it's deficient eyes closed, so I know there's a sleep problem. And Here's our buddy, the depression marker, and here's <coughs> the uh, uh, theta-beta ratio, again, being larger over on the uh, right side of the brain. Okay, so <coughs> what we have here is poor sleep, depression, <coughs> and uh, the trauma marker. Okay. 
Now the good news is her alpha is very fast. So I know that the uh, our, our treatment here is going to be very efficacious, or at least that's my hypothesis, because I'm not fighting the problem of a uh, inefficient brain. So I don't have to get the brain to be more efficient before I start the uh, the treatment. So you can see that uh, in terms of her identification, she was exposed to severe emotional stra uh, trauma, sleep problems, <clears throat> emotional impulse control, and that's that uh, elevated uh, theta-beta ratio on the right. Uh, and her present uh, medication was trazodone. So again, what we found Standard, standard, standard with fibromyalgia, sleep. <clears throat> also the marker for depression. Now, and the right side of the brain, when you have excessive beta amplitude sitting over there, that's a marker for depressed mood states. However, on the left side, if you have a lot of slow frequency over there, then that means that the right's more active than the left. That's a depression marker as well. Now, when we get that elevated slow frequency over here, slow frequency amplitude, that's the marker that Dr. Donaldson uh, uh, discovered. And that's the marker for that you find in fibromyalgia, but it's also associated with emotional volatility. And then our good friend in the back of the brain, right in here, and when there's a deficiency in the theta-beta ratio, then you can bet the farm that there's going to be a sleep problem. And sleep is the number one factor in terms of fibromyalgia, and you saw that in our initial uh, uh, list of uh, symptoms. Sleep was up in the uh, sleep problems were up in the 90% range right across the board. Now let's shift gears over to uh, uh, chronic fatigue. A lot of people feel that chronic fatigue is just a precursor or it, it's like a uh, close relative of fibromyalgia. The fatigue is of an unknown cause. That's the bottom line. So, and fatigue, again, for over six months, there's uh, usually cognitive difficulties there's sore throat, there's tender lymph nodes, so there is muscle pain, joint pain, and very often uh, chronic fatigue, what they're calling chronic fatigue, is really fibromyalgia. <clears throat> uh, sleep, and it can be oversleeping, uh, but poor sleep quality, that's the bottom line. And exertion gives rise to huge amounts of fatigue. <clears throat> I want to rule out chlamydia, candida, Lyme's disease, Epstein-Barr, infectious diseases, yeast infections, and depression. So there are a lot of conditions that we want to make sure that this person has gone through a standard medical workup. Uh, is there any reason for this fatigue other than inefficient brain activity? Now, we, of course, do the brain assessment to make sure, or at least to see whether we're getting the brain markers for uh, chronic fatigue. And here they are. <clears throat> now, you'll notice there's a huge overlap between chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So they are related disorders, and I really feel that and it's on a dimension, chronic fatigue up through fibromyalgia. Excuse me, there are people who disagree with me about that, but that's kind of what it looks like if you look at the brain. So the first thing we're seeing here, the highlighted yellow areas, <coughs> excuse me, exposure to severe emotional stress. So there's our trauma marker a huge marker for sleep problem. There's the back of the brain, or one is the back of the brain, and we want this between 1.8 and 2.2, two, and eyes closed, this person's sitting at half the normal range, 
and that's your primary marker for sleep quality problem. Front part of the brain, <coughs> here's our depression marker in which the right side of the brain and <coughs> has 43 percent greater <coughs> beta amplitude as compared to the right and also has the Donaldson marker associated with uh, uh, the uh, fibromyalgia marker and inefficient brain activity. So very, very similar to what we see in fibromyalgia. And this is a person who has had both diagnoses, uh, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue also uh, diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and of course, <clears throat> poor sleep. Now the reason this is of interest is because this profile is a little different than some of the ones that we see. There are some overlaps. First of all, we've got a marginal trauma marker, it's not very severe. And if you look at the back of the brain, there's a huge alpha response. Now, this is what I usually call the traumatized artist signature. Artists tend to have extremely strong and robust alpha responses. And if you get some blunting, uh, it's, sometimes it's hard to see uh, if you are just taking averages because their resident alpha is so strong, you don't see any of the uh, telltale signs of exposure to severe emotional stress, which is uh, some, uh, uh, it just looks like somebody's pushing down the alpha. I treat a lot of artists with the artist block and they all look like this. They look like <clears throat> there's a strong alpha response, but you can see that something is interfering with it. Okay, so we've got the trauma marker. <clears throat> We also have a lot of elevated slow frequency up over the sensory motor strip. Now, generally speaking, we would be talking about an attention problem here. This is a, the marker for common attention deficit disorder, where we have elevated slow frequency up over the sensory motor strip. The back of the brain, you'll notice that the uh, theta beta ratios aren't very aren't bad at all, and they uh, uh, you know they're hair on the low side, but certainly not uh, of the nature that we saw in the previous uh, uh, protocols. There is a mild drop in the theta beta ratio under eyes closed conditions, and when you get drops usually greater than this, then that often uh, is a marker for some degree of sleep disturbance. What it means is the brain is turning on when you close your eyes. But if we look at the frontal cortex, then we have this situation of a marker for depressed mood states and a marker for emotional volatility. And again, that's the same one that Donaldson identified associated with fibromyalgia. The brain efficiency marker looks okay. So and you can see that this has some of the same characteristics of what the, the uh, pro protocol profiles that I've been showing you previously, but it doesn't have that level of severity associated with it. Uh, we do have a trauma marker. We do have a mild. Uh, uh, drop in the theta beta ratio under eyes closed, uh, but we do have some principal markers here for depression. Now, there are a couple of ways of going about this. If you're a physician and considering an antidepressant, for example, as a possible uh, uh, treatment of this, the first thing I would want to do is I would want to increase the efficiency of the brain. I'd want to get that low high alpha or alpha peak frequency down to make my antidepressant more efficacious. The second thing I would be doing is I would try to balance the frontal cortex. So you may not need, need uh, medication at all or 
uh, if you're able to do this, the antidepressant is more efficacious as a bridging to uh, getting this under control and then titrate down off the medication. By the way, you'll notice that this woman is only 24 years of age. Okay, <clears throat> you get a lot of people coming in who don't know what they have. They just feel worn out and exhausted and they don't have any particular idea of what's going on. Now, this is a woman, uh, 34. Uh, she has low blood pressure so, and that can often be associated with feelings of chronic fatigue. So the question is, what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with uh, a problem associated with uh, 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 body tension in terms of adequate blood pressure? Is that what's causing the problem? Or are we dealing with multiple contributory factors? So the first thing is, this is the uh, alpha response. The break point we have is about 30%. This is sitting just a hair above that. And in the back of the brain, the break point is 50. This is just a hair above it. Now, if this person has strong resident alpha, uh, that is somebody with good visualization skills, this may actually be a trauma marker because it's just squeaking above the acceptable range. So I want to keep that in mind as I'm forming my hypotheses about what's going on with this client as I'm moving through. Okay, the back of the brain, we have some mild deficiencies here. And again, we have that marker for sleep disturbance, but it's not huge. <clears throat> Look up in the front part of the brain. What we're picking up, again, is that elevated slow frequency on the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the other thing that we're picking up is elevated uh, theta, uh, beta ratio, again, on the right. Okay. So uh, we have the markers here in terms of emotional volatility, uh, fogginess, and what could be the uh, fibromyalgia marker. Then we see what's going on at the anterior cingulate gyrus. And here's our, here's our uh, culprit. So this individual has a huge uh, issue associated with hyperactivity of that region in the brain. So get something on your mind, you can't get it out. And that is often associated with severe sleep disturbance. This is the kind of condition, everybody has had some exposure to this. You know, you're going to sleep and uh, there's something you have to do and you get caught up and the brain won't, uh, won't shut down. Even if you are in, in uh, light uh, level sleep, you have these troubling dreams. Uh, if you're, you know, you have to paint the room in your house and, uh, uh, you know, do you know where the uh, paintbrush is and it, you know you just keep fussing about that all night and you can't get it out of your mind. Now if you um, multiply that by a few thousand and then you get an idea of how this can be sleep disturbing as soon as this individual closes their eyes this kicks in and it just uh, is a huge disturber and primarily of deep wave sleep. And if you're not getting deep wave sleep, you're in, in serious, serious trouble. And that's the, the uh, primary factor associated with fibromyalgia. So <clears throat> she's on Zopiclone, which is a sleep med. And one thing you want to remember is medicated sleep is not sleep. This is a sleep <clears throat> assessment. We do sleep assessments at the Swingle Clinic. Uh, these are EEG devices that the client takes home. We measure the brain activity over a four-night period, so it's not a snapshot uh, that you get in sleep labs. You know, when you go in, you get a four-hour uh, snapshot picture. We have four nights here, so we can test the reliability of the uh, assessment. Is this 
really a, a good uh, indicator of what you're experiencing. Uh, is it consistent over four days? And we test some various things as well. We test some of our sleep aids to see whether it in fact is working. So you can see the problem here. Red means she's awake. Time to get to sleep is two and a half hours to fall asleep. And the amount of REM, she's getting a half hour of REM. She needs two hours. She's getting 22 minutes of deep wave sleep. She needs an hour. Okay. So if I can do something for this lady to fix her sleep, my guess is everything else will just melt away. So if I can <clears throat> get the uh, and restore adequate sleep, that's the game changer. Okay. And the bottom line again, in this case, we have a deficiency in the back of the brain, <clears throat> but it's not very severe. <clears throat> but what made the difference with this woman is our buddy right in here, sits right in the center, the anterior cingulate gyrus. And when that's hot, <clears throat> coupled with a mild deficiency in the back of the brain, uh, sleep is the casualty. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sungo. We have another question from a professional in the field. Do you see a relationship between healthy low alpha, high alpha ratios uh, in terms of efficiency and normal coherence uh, measures, reflecting good response to treatment? I'm sorry, and normal coherence? Yes, normal coherence. <coughs> Yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting data on connectivity, and uh, normal coherence uh, uh, is a, a uh, indicator of good brain efficiency. But the bottom line here is alpha peak frequency. Uh, with that measure, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what you'll find, by the way, is if you restore uh, peak frequency, uh, uh, get it up into the uh, high nines, uh, low tens, then you're going to have good connectivity. I mean, it just comes with the territory. Thank you. And the final question, I was told fibromyalgia is a progressive and not curable disease, but you can just treat symptoms. Is this true? Well, <laughs> I think you've been, uh, you can see what we've been talking about here, that if you attend to the putative causes like sleep, imbalances in the front part of the brain, you can treat fibromyalgia. Yes, uh, it is not one of the it, you know the old notion of progressive, non-treatable is just wrong. <clears throat> but the traditional treatments are not effective. That we know, and the game changes get the alpha peak frequency so the brain is efficient, restore sleep, and balance the frontal cortex in terms of the mood state. Get the person to get a uh, pedometer or something of that nature, start an adequate exercise program. Thank you. Um, for those of you who didn't uh, get a chance to um, ask questions, you can also send them to Angie at SungoClinic.com and we will continue to stay on time. Okay, pediatric uh, chronic fatigue, <clears throat> again, females, uh, and severe school absenteeism, so you can get some idea what that does to the poor uh, child's uh, academic performance and uh, influences their uh, academic uh, uh, trajectory, uh, careers, everything else. Uh, Typically, we find that it, it is a consequence of some previous inflammatory condition, like a severe viral infection, for example. Uh, unlikely in younger, in uh, uh, children less than 10 years of age. And I really think it's a different kind of situation than the common criteria we use for, uh, for males associated with it. And the, uh, the child uh, uh, is chronically fatigued and it's easily confused with 
or it may actually be a more severe form of uh, depression because in very young children depression doesn't uh, necessarily uh, uh, indicate severe sadness. It may just be a lack of joy uh, and most important lack of interest and motivation. So a lot of things that you want to get sorted out here and it's the brain assessment that's going to tell the story. So that's why the brain assessment it is so critical in terms of being able to assess what's going on and secondarily treating these conditions. Now mild traumatic brain injury has a lot of characteristics that mimic all of these things. For example, you have chronic pain and mild traumatic brain injury. You have problems concentrating, problems with attention. You have, have fatigue, effort fatigue. Remember that's one of the uh, characteristics or one of the criteria for diagnosis of uh, chronic fatigue. Depression and bingo, the sleep disturbance. Now it's interesting that some of the gateways into conditions like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue may be something like a head injury that gives rise to a sleep disturbance and it's the sleep disturbance that gives rise to, to uh, turning the key for any predisposition an individual may have for fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. A treatment of this, for those folks who don't know, this is straightforward neurofeedback in which we uh, put the wires on the ears for reference and ground and put a wire, in this case it's right on top of this uh, young woman's head and uh, what uh, she's looking at is a, a game that the kids use. So for example, when the brain's doing what we want it to do, uh, the uh, flying saucer is going to move when it stops doing what we want it to do, it stops. When it uh, does what we want it to do. So they're playing a video game with their brain, basically. This is the screen I showed you earlier. And uh, for adults who want to look at the raw data, we can give uh, all of the raw data that they can observe. And these are uh, thermometer-like uh, feedback. And there's the training threshold. So we want her to get that a green uh, below that training threshold and when it's below she might hear a tone for example. Brain driving is what we find is the most effective for the treatment of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. Now brain driving makes use of classical conditioning procedures as opposed to operant conditioning procedures that are used in neurofeedback. In this case we measure brain activity and based on those measurements we stimulate with light. So this woman is wearing <coughs> goggles with lights in it, sound, uh, micro amperage stimulation. In this case we're stimulating an acupuncture location. And so we're driving the brain. We can apply <coughs> sounds at various times to push down the amplitude of a particular brain wave. Uh, this is the kind of thing that can happen. Uh, here we're trying to increase the slow frequency, decrease the fast frequency in the back of the brain. Remember the theta-beta ratio in the back of the brain. And in this case, what happened was we reduced the beta amplitude by 24%. Theta didn't move at all. And we got a change of 31% in the ratio in the back of the brain in one session. And here's another one, now, which is a much bigger increase. And here we were going after beta. <clears throat> and what we were getting is a 22% reduction in beta amplitude, 24% uh, increase in theta. And we had a huge 60% change in the theta-beta ratio. That's in normal range. <clears throat> now, because we're using a driving, a very aggressive procedure, it will not stay there after treatment. Obviously, it's going to <clears throat> decrease a bit, uh, but it will not decrease to the point it was prior to treatment. So it's pushed up, it'll uh, decrease a bit. 
uh, and, and that's how we move forward. And then we usually stabilize it by having the person do straightforward brainwave biofeedback. Remember our buddy, the anterior cingular gyrus? Well, here we went after that in terms of reduction of that very fast beta activity, 28 to 40 cycles a second, and slower beta activity, 16 to 25. And we got a very nice decrease in the, that ratio, the high beta gamma ratio, indicating the activity of the anterior cingulate. So these are the aggressive treatments that are possible for some of these really problematic areas. Early on in neurotherapy's history, <clears throat> we, uh, there was a lot of feeling that it was almost impossible to get changes in beta amplitude without a huge number of sessions, and sometimes it wouldn't move at all. Well, if you use very aggressive uh, brain-driving procedures, you can make very important uh, changes in some of these areas. Okay, now, we've been focusing on the brain. But one of the things that we find is if you look at the cases of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, inflammatory and irritable bowel kinds of conditions, we find that there's a lot of sympathetic nervous system arousal. In other words, things like muscle tension, breathing, electrodermal response, <clears throat> peripheral blood flow. So. This is a device designed to quiet the central nervous system. This is a cranial electrical stimulator. It's, a, it's a registered with the FDA, approved for sleep, depression, and anxiety. We also use the old classic progressive muscle relaxation. And there are a couple of variations on that. And what we use is a progressive muscle relaxation and then a cognitive form of that in which uh, uh, you're not actually tensing muscles. You're thinking about reducing them. OK, so these are the kinds of things that we use in addition to brain activity to address the hyperarousal of the sympathetic nervous system. And here's a fella who had very few neurotherapy sessions but he was doing cranial electrical stimulation at home. He was doing progressive muscle relaxation, relaxation and the cognitive tension reduction. That's that soothe uh, uh, harmonic and uh, CD that I was just showing you. <clears throat> OK. And he did uh, some visits with us in terms of addressing the uh, area up over the uh, sensory motor strip and the anterior cingulate gyrus. And here's the number of no pain days recorded. Started off with no pain days and zero days without pain. And he ended up with roughly 66% days without pain. And if you look at his sleep, started at five hours, went up to six hours. So here's a very nice change in the behavior associated with the pain and with the sleep associated with a number of uh, EEG sessions, but primarily home use of uh, systems designed to address the sympathetic nervous system. This was a man, a 70-year-old man, who was physically attacked and beaten. Uh, and uh, poor memory, uh, memory loss, a lot of uh, issues associated with head injury. Uh, pain, and he was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and this is the way he was treated. Thank you, Dr. Swingle. That was very interesting. And now I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are interested in learning about neurotherapy, this book is a great resource. It's called Biofeedback for the Brain. Uh, obviously, it's written by Dr. Swingle, and would like to think is the most important book that you'll ever read for yourself, your children, and grandchildren, and it is available on our Sound Health Products website. Also, we have the Clinician's Guide. This is literature for professionals. It is currently under revision. Uh, Dr. Sungo is working on a new edition that's going to be released in the fall. If you want to be added on a wait list to be one of the first ones to receive it, you can send me an email at angie at 
We have an advanced workshop for professionals coming up in uh, October. Um, the dates are the 24th to the 26th, it's on a weekend. Um, and if you want to learn more and or to register, you can visit swingleclinic.com uh, under the events page. Um, due to popular demand, we have another date for a public lecture in Vancouver. Uh, also in October. It's going to be on Thursday, October 30th at the Vancouver uh, Library. It's um, uh, Seating is limited, so if you want to attend, please RSVP by phoning us at 604-608-0444 or emailing reception at swingleclinic.com. If you enjoyed this website and you want to learn more about what's coming up in future months, uh, we have our schedule up on our website. Here are some of the topics that we're going to be discussing uh, in the next few months. And uh, also for professionals, uh, Dr. Swingle offers uh, different courses through the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe. If you want more information, you can visit the BFE website at www.bfe.org or you can also reach his online team at blueswingle at gmail.com. And we have a variety of products through Sound Health products. Um, if you'd like to get more information about these, you can visit our website. And as featured today uh, on this chat, we talked about Sooth, um, which is a harmonic depreometer in the CES unit. So I'm very excited to let you know that we are going to have 20% discount for webcast participants only. Uh, to receive that discount, uh, you can email angie at swingleclinic.com. This offer is for one week only, so it expires next Friday, August 15th. So if you're interested in any of these three products, please send me an email and I'll be happy to help. Okay, well, this is the end of today's episode. It's all in your head. It was great having you all, and we certainly hope you enjoy the show. We will be back live on September 20th to discuss the neurotherapeutic treatment of depression and seasonal affective disorder. Have a great weekend, everyone.